out inside the show. Uh, so I am coming to you from just outside the fence, outside the Lincoln Memorial, uh, where just a little while ago there was a huge line of people trying to get into this. It was open to the public. There were also people uh, who were invited guests who had tickets, and the line literally stretched as far as my eye could see. So people were waiting a long time to get in here, excited to see Donald Trump to be part of the festivities. We talked to people literally from around the country as far away as California, uh, from Alabama. I talked to one woman from South Carolina who's 87 years old, and this is her fifth inauguration. She's been coming to them since the Reagan and Nixon days, uh, so she was pretty excited to be here. Uh, there were a few protesters here earlier. There were members of that uh, group called Code Pink uh, who often show up at political events. Uh, but then there were equally some Trump supporters. I saw a lot of people wearing Make America Great Again hats, uh, T-shirts, dressed up with American flags, a lot of patriotism on display here. So a festive mood. Uh, definitely the people here are here to celebrate. Uh, and uh, there, we did talk to someone earlier who was Trump supporter who engaged with some of those protesters and they had a little discussion. Here's more of what he told us. You know, obviously we see across the country all the racial division, the sex division, all the division that's going on. But uh, I think there's more that brings us together. But a lot of times we don't see that. We just see a lot of the, you know, the fighting and the hatred. And unfortunately, I think over the last eight years, we've seen more division from the left. They claim that the Republicans are racist, sexist, homophobes, all this, bigots. But in reality, the left is, is the, who divides us into racial groups, into sexual groups, into you know, all the different isms. So I've been talking to lots of Trump supporters, too, because obviously there's lots of them around. And just so people know, Megan, I'm sort of near the Capitol building, which is at one end of the National Mall. You're at the other end. Uh, what, what are we expecting from this evening, this concert? Who's performing? Tell us anything about what you know about how it's going to unfold. Yeah. Well, this show's uh, expected to last about two hours. It got started a little late. Uh, but in terms of the performers, the biggest name is Toby Keith, the country singer who's known for a lot of his songs that are about America and very patriotic themes. Uh, the rock band Three Doors Down also scheduled to perform. One of the other big, big names that was supposed to perform, Rosie, is Grammy award-winning singer uh, Jennifer Holliday, who, uh, after it was announced that she was going to be performing, there was a big backlash from some of her fans who were rather upset about that. So she actually withdrew from participating. So she's not among the performers tonight. Uh, and then there are some other uh, military bands and so on. But really, Toby Keith and Three Doors Down, the biggest names uh, on the list. So it's not exactly, you know, Beyonce or any of those uh, A-listers. Uh, but Trump's campaign, the team has been asked about that in terms of just the celebrity effect this weekend in general. And they're saying that's fine with them, that there aren't these big names uh, here this weekend, because they say they want a lot of these inauguration events like this one and the one that took place just a bit before it. Uh, there's another concert called Voices of the People. They say they want these inauguration events to be of, by, and for the people, that it's really about, you know, the American people that are here gathered to celebrate Trump. So they're fine that it's not a big star-studded event here, uh, but it'll be about two hours of musical entertainment. Uh, Trump is expected to address the crowd, so we'll be watching for that. And then they're going to finish off the evening with a fireworks show, apparently. All right, I did run into a fellow earlier, a Trump supporter, Megan, who asked if we could if we could take all of the celebrities into Canada. He was done with them. So, yeah, you're right. They want it to be about the people. Anyway, we'll, we'll uh, keep... <laughs> I actually heard that from someone here, too. Probably not the yeah. same guy, even. Okay, so we'll keep listening. Yeah, somebody and told me the exact same thing here. In interesting. Life. Interesting. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, dip, was. Okay. we'll dip in. We'll dip in when we hear uh, from Donald Trump speaking to the crowd there. That's the CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick. We'll check back with her later. She, as I said, just near the Lincoln Memorial. Starting at noon tomorrow, Donald Trump will be the president. So, of course, we're Canadian. We want to know what will change for us. Trump's pick for Commerce Secretary, for instance, Wilbur Ross, says every aspect of NAFTA is open for negotiation or renegotiation. How will Canada respond? Earlier today, in fact, just over there outside of his office, I caught up with Canada's ambassador to the United States, David McNaughton, as he's preparing to host a big tailgate party down here that's been called the hottest ticket in town. Ambassador, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us here, hosting us here. Glad you could come. And you're having a bunch of other people, like yeah, 1,800 people or something. 1,800 of my closest friends are coming tomorrow, <laughs> so uh, it's going to be a good, uh, good event. And we've got uh, 
lots of Canadians, but lots of Americans too. People from the Hill and uh, from all over. So it's going to be a good day. Okay. Uh, let's not talk so much about parties. Let's start talking about the work that you've been doing to try and build up relationships with people. Where would you say things stand on that front? Well, you know, we've we've uh, had a very sort of positive engagement with the with the Trump transition team. Uh, we've had lots of conversations, uh, mostly in the beginning, just kind of getting to know you. Yeah. Uh, but of late, it's been a little bit more focused on trying to set out uh, some of the things we want to talk about in a substantive way. Um, and so far, it's been uh, it's been constructive engagement with them uh, obviously after tomorrow yeah. I think that'll ramp up because uh, a lot of the secretaries that haven't been confirmed haven't been yep. part of the conversation yet so. so so what I imagine trade is sort of the number one priority for you yeah, yeah. for sure uh, and it also seems to be his number one priority yep. so if, if everyone's willing to sit down and talk about NAFTA does everything have to be on the table from all sides well, I think, I think it's important to remember that most of the focus of their NAFTA discussion is focused or where, where they have issues is focused on Mexico. Sure. Um, they have said, I think clear, clearly even uh, Wilbur Ross said yesterday, they don't really have too many issues with us. Um, but I think, you know, we're, I said right after the election and have reiterated since that uh, uh, we're prepared to talk about anything in NAFTA that uh, will strengthen our economy and obviously will strengthen the U.S. economy. And but there's it, lots of areas where that can happen. But if there are things there that will strengthen the U.S. economy but maybe hurt us, border adjustment taxes, that kind of thing that Republicans are already whispering about, what what, what do we do? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think part of the discussion has got to be that uh, about uh, not putting up barriers to trade between Canada and the United States. It's uh, uh, we, we don't have a trade deficit with the United States in manufacturing goods. Uh, I don't believe that the Americans are going to try to do something that's going to hurt their economy. There's nine million jobs in the United States that are dependent on trade with Canada. Uh, I don't see any evidence that they want to cut their nose off to spite their face. The, the, what everyone that I've talked to about Donald Trump and his approach on trade seems to suggest is if you can make a case to him that this is good for jobs and good for the United States, is that what the kind of case you yeah, are exactly. building? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think I think it's 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 important that when we think about uh, discussions with them, that we're not just talking about what's good for us. Uh, you, yeah, know, you should be nice to us because we're yeah. Canadians. It's, it's, you should be, we should be doing this together because it's good for jobs in both Canada and the United States. And certainly uh, with, with Trump's people and with uh, Wilbur Ross, that's been the tenor of the discussion. Have you sat down with him? Yes. And yes. What, what, was, what was that conversation like? Well, it was a two-hour conversation that went over a whole series of things and not just in not just uh, NAFTA issues but uh, some of the other things that uh, we see as opportunities uh, like there what? Are, give me an example well I think that there's uh, we, you know we've had in place this um, regulatory cooperation council which has been harmonizing regulations between Canada and the United States mm -hmm. uh, and yet protecting safety and health of Canadians and uh, I think there are areas where we can make that uh, more effective, that'll be good for consumers, good for small and medium-sized business in both Canada and the United States. We talked about potentially some uh, border infrastructure that we might do together, maybe get them to pay for some of it this time rather than what, what, what happened at the Gordie Howe Bridge. Um, and, and just a whole host of, uh, of things where there are opportunities for us to work together, whether it be in uh, technology, things like cybersecurity. Yeah. So there's, you know, when you've got an $800 billion uh, economic relationship, there's lots of good things to talk about. Yeah, uh, so trade is your focus, but obviously you, you have to sort of be the go-between on foreign policy as well. Um, we heard from the former prime minister today sort of warning about the upending <coughs> of foreign policy in this world that, that has been in place for seven decades. How, how much can you do on that front? I mean, I know Minister Freeland will certainly be the, the lead, but how much can you sort of be on the ground listening to what, what might really be the vision or what might, they might really be thinking on some of these big issues that are so unsettling? Well, I think, you know, for starters, um, the president-elect becomes the president tomorrow. Uh, he has named a, uh, or nominated a secretary of state who is an extraordinarily talented and smart person. 
And I think, uh, you know, the world should uh, wait and see a little bit mm -hmm. as to uh, how all this evolves. We want to play a constructive role uh, with the Americans, but also with our partners uh, in, in NATO and around the world. Uh, but I think we should, uh, uh, people shouldn't, uh, shouldn't panic we should be uh, we should give the give them a chance and I think that you've got when you got people like Tillerson I think uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic actually really um, generally the president goes to Canada for the first visit are you hearing anything about that you Has know we've gotten a call about that we, yet well <laughs> no we, we've discussed with them um, you know whether uh, he would come to Canada whether we would uh, you know, come here, uh, you know, and, and nothing's been resolved yet, but it will be soon. I think we'll have that discussion next week. I think, obviously, they've been pretty preoccupied yes, with all yeah. of this, and so... Uh, Would that be important, do you think, as a signal for, do you know, I don't know, I, for I, him I, even, I, to the world? Yeah, I, 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 I know there's a tradition, and I, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's a demonstration of our friendship. But you know, I'm really much more concerned about the substance of the relationship rather than the symbolism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think symbols are important, but but I, we're really focused on 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 making sure our trade and economic relationship with the United States and our security relationship is strong, and that's more about substance than it is uh, symbols. Um, let, let me leave it on this. What, what do you think is going to change? I mean, I, I, he's got a 100-day plan. Yeah. Nothing can happen. There's some things that he could do very, very quickly. But what do you think changes starting, say, Monday? Because I think he's taking the weekend off, he suggested. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, any time there's a change in administration or change in government, as it was yeah. in Canada last yeah. year, there, there are things that are going to be done differently. But w when you look at the depth and the breadth of the relationship between Canada and the United States, um, I think what we really need to focus in on is how we can improve it rather than worrying about change. We, should, we shouldn't be afraid of change, we should embrace change, we should make it work for us. But we've got to also make it work for them, and I think that's where we're—that's where what our focus is. And, and that's uh, the thing that's different, though, isn't it? Yeah, the and fact I, that you have to sell what, how we can help them more. Well, I think we had to—we always have to do that. Uh, I think that these—I think that the, the the type of people that he's named to his administration, the people who are around him, tend to be because a lot of them haven't been in government. They tend to be much more, you know, action-oriented, yes, yeah. focusing on outcomes. Yeah. I don't mind that. That's 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 how I look at things too, and I think that's how our government looks at things. So. Okay. I'm encouraged. Well, have fun at the inauguration. Have fun at the party. Yeah, I will. And then you have to get back to work. Yeah, I know. I know. It <laughs> never seems to stop. It doesn't. It's, it's a good uh, job. It's, it, this is not a sinecure, you know? So. <laughs> thank you, Ambassador. All right, thank you. It. Thank you. All right, we're going to take you back live to the Make America Great Again welcome celebration. That's uh, the band Three Doors Down. What you did miss was uh, Donald Trump. Was He's enjoying himself and singing along to a lot of the people performing. That's happening just outside the Lincoln Memorial here in Washington at the end of the National Mall. Thousands of people are gathered there, as is the president-elect and his family. Very celebratory, festive move, and just gorgeous to look at. Donald Trump's day began uh, in his hometown of New York, but he arrived early this afternoon in Washington on a military jet, not his own plane. Trump and his family flew into Joint Base Andrews. He saluted an Air Force officer who welcomed him there as he and his wife Melania stepped off the jet. His arrival now kicks off three days of inaugural celebrations. And then his first stop this afternoon, Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. A somber ceremony for Trump and Vice President-elect Mike Pence as they attended a wreath lane ceremony this afternoon. Members from both of their families were also there, honoring Americans who have died in military conflict. And then he made his way back down to the Lincoln Memorial. We are expecting to hear from him uh, at some point during this welcome rally. There he is with his wife, Melania, as well. And, um, of course, we're going to hear from him tomorrow. Donald Trump says that he has written his inaugural speech himself. We know that because last night he, pictured, he tweeted out a picture of him in Mar-a-Lago actually writing it. He says that happened three weeks ago in his winter home in Florida. So we'll see how that goes tomorrow. Uh, coming up next on Power and Politics, my conversation with a newly minted Republican congressman whose district shares a border with Canada. What does he think Trump's tough talk on trade will mean for the cross-border relationship? There's that and lots more. And, of course, we'll hear from the man himself, the president-elect at some point, live in Washington. 
after this short break. Stay there. All right, so you obviously voted for the guy. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of self-evident. <laughs> and you're excited about tomorrow? Why? Yes. It's a festive atmosphere here. Um, we enjoy it. Um, I see it as a time of change, and I see the country coming together. Yeah. What, what are you hoping to see from the president in his first 100 days day? That he will run this country as well as he runs his own personal business. Amen to that. And bring our country to prosperity. Bring Amer Instead of bringing, making America great again, I want him to see make America, America again. I think the president's message on trade has been fairly clear. Um, he is going to fight for American workers and American manufacturing, and that's going to be the number one thing that guides him going forward. That's Donald Trump's press secretary, who gave his first press conference today and took a number of questions on trade. There are, of course, a lot of questions about how Canada-U.S. trade could change under President Trump. What do border states think will happen? Earlier today, I sat down with a newly minted Republican uh, Michigan congressman, Paul Mitchell. His district shares a border with Canada. Here's what he told me. Congressman, thanks for joining me. Appreciate it. Happy to do it. Oh, nice to meet you. Um, there are a lot of jobs in Michigan that depend on Canada. Sure. Michigan and Canada, good, good relationship. What concerns do you have about this whole let's renegotiate NAFTA? What, what would be some of the immediate concerns you would have as a congressman from Michigan? I think we need to not, um, I guess I say, overreact to the whole conversation about, about NAFTA. Uh, what was it? 25 years ago, NAFTA was put in place. And I come from private business. 
where do you have a deal that you did 25 years ago that you don't say, wait a minute, we need to sit down and talk about, is this working for everybody? Yeah. Is this working for Mexico, United States and Canada? And if there are places it's not, let's have a conversation about it. Um, and, and being a private business guy that I, I can't speak for a president like Trump, uh, you start by saying, we have concerns mm -hmm. and I'll have a conversation. Um, Canada, Lord knows, has been an incredible ally and a business partner for the United States for years, uh, for decades. So let's, let's, no one's throwing it out with the baby or the bathwater. Let's have the conversation, see if NAFTA works well now compared to what, what the intent was 25 years ago. One of the things that you, I mean, this is like uh, the president-elect, but you got elected on a promise of jobs. Let's get people, let's mm -hmm. create jobs, let's get people back to work. Are there people in, in your state who feel like globalization, NAFTA, those kinds of things have pull jobs out of Michigan and, and and then how do you do it? How do you fix it? Oh, I think there's evidence that it has pulled jobs yeah. out of the country and out of Michigan. I, I, it may well have pulled jobs out of Canada as well. I, I don't know your economy as well. Um, I, th I think you fix that by f having a focus not only on, on free trade but fair trade. And fair trade means it's balanced for all parties in the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, trade should not be based upon some, some desire you have that you're going to build another nation. You want to help nations grow. But you can't do it when you disadvantage your own country, your own people that are depending on you as a leader. You're, not, you're, you're responsible for making sure you don't throw them under the bus in terms of trying to build an uh, international economy. So um, it has cost jobs, and I think we have to balance our, our trade agreements so that we make sure that they are fair. Now, my district's gained from uh, trade, clearly in some areas. Uh, agriculture has been a huge, uh, a huge benefit from uh, free trade. So let's, let's just make sure we're looking at the fair trade part of that and having honest, open conversations about what's fair for all parties. So when Republicans talk about this idea of a border tax, that could potentially hurt uh, businesses on both sides of the border in, in Michigan because you're so, we're so interconnected there. Would that be troubling to you, that conversation? I don't, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> we need to move beyond it. And with all due respect to the media, we need to move beyond uh, sometimes how some of the media in the United States portrays things. Mm -hmm. Uh, being a member of the leadership group here, uh, elected to represent freshman leadership, uh, the discussions in terms of tax reform here is about reforming our tax code so that in fact we get a border adjustability on our taxes. Most countries do that. Canada does that. They have an income tax and a VAT. Uh -huh. uh, so it's, we're not going to have a dual tax system, but we're going to do something that allows us to effectively have a tax system that allows companies to bring back on shore profits they make overseas. Uh, I think the current estimate is $3 trillion is offshore that, that American-based companies have made. They can't bring the United States because of our tax system. Uh, when, so we, we need to fix that. Well, uh, on security, on border security, you, you are home to the, the Blue Water Bridge. That's one of the busiest. We share that with Canada. And <laughs> yeah. it, it is, it's hugely busy. If you're, and, you know, it, you, it's any given day you look at that and they're backed up for quite a while. So, you, so you know how important it is to have so, the free-flowing, uh, you know, secure border, but, yep. but free-flowing goods as well. Do you have concerns that the border between Michigan and Canada could be thickened? Do we need to worry about that kind of uh, language? It, it does seem to be something Republicans talk increasingly about. Well, we need to finish our investment uh, on our side, the United States side of the Blue Water Bridge, to finish the investment that was made quite a while ago and is still unfinished uh, to ensure that traffic does flow and goods flow freely. That has not been done. It's one of the things I'll pursue here to make sure that whole that whole area is completed, Customs and Border Protection is completed, so we can actually move goods. Right. In terms of border protection itself, I think both countries need to be concerned when you've got a one mile or less than one mile of the St. Clair River. Uh, border there that we, we, we secure that so we don't end up with people traversing back and forth that neither country wants wandering that border. Mm. Um, that's, that's a problem we need to continue to look at and invest in. Um, how we do that is really a matter of technology and vigilance in my opinion. We don't need to go wild on it, but I think we need to pay attention to it. We recently had, a, it was during the fall, we had uh, a boat come into port here and that had several uh, Polish nationals on the, on the boat that weren't legal that came into a boat came across and up the Black River and Border Protection caught them but we need to pay attention to that. Uh, who knows why they were there I don't have any information on that but we need to make sure that we don't have people just wandering around. Mm. Um, you've got a Republican president, Republican Congress, you're starting out as you say you're part of the leadership team. How do you think this is all going to work together because uh, you know, th it's not that there's a split between the Republican president and the Republican Congress, but there are differences of sure. opinion. And I know you're new; you're starting out <laughs> fresh, which is probably a good way to start uh, out. But brand new, maybe no baggage. <laughs> maybe to carry all the baggage of the past. How, what do you think will be the relationship? What do you envision it being um, between everybody? You know, uh, 
my wife doesn't agree with me about everything, never mind people I work with. Uh, I think the, uh, the uh, in being, in disagreeing is having a conversation about what is, we, what do we think the best solution is? Uh, focusing on the policy and, and being respectful, whether it's Republican between us and the administration, or whether it's, it's with Democrats about what sure. we're going to do. You can disagree without being disagreeable. You can be respectful, and then kind of resolution you think is the best answer. Uh, we have uh, our government which is structured with, with independence and uh, checks and balances. Yeah. Congress operates as Congress, not a wholly owned subsidiary of any, any other unit of government. Not unlike uh, Parliament, you're a little different yeah. with Parliament yeah. there, but nevertheless yeah. still, it's, it is an independent function and we're going to maintain that. And the relationship between the President-elect then and Congress will be what? It will be a healthy one? Um, Seems to be already. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I, I'm aware from conversations we've had, meetings we've had, that uh, Speaker Ryan talks with uh, soon-to-be President Trump uh, daily or every other day uh, directly on, on their cell phones uh, about what the prion is. Uh, with the Vice President, he's been in to talk with the Republican Conference at least twice, I'm aware of, I was there for, mm -hmm. talked about what uh, we're going to work on, how we're going to work together. Um, People read far more into what they see as messaging that goes on in the media about whether they disagree. Uh, I don't see massive disagreement, and if they are around the edges. And uh, one thing you can say about Donald Trump is uh, he gets things done. Mm -hmm. uh, his view on things very clearly from feedback from the folks over there in the transition team is, is getting things done. There's a 200-day schedule that's been put together of things they want to get done with, with the uh, uh, the speakers put together, and uh, there's an action plan on moving things forward in a very aggressive and assertive way. Yeah. And is that a good thing, or, or do you think that Americans are prepared for that kind of change that quickly? I think that's why they elected Donald Trump. Uh, I'm absolutely certain that's why they elected me in my district. Is I came from business where we didn't sit around talking about uh, you know, things for, for years on end. We actually accomplished something or I wouldn't have had a job. My board of directors would have said, see you later, and yeah. I owned a fair amount of the company, but uh, performance matters, and, uh, and performance will matter here. Uh, I can't imagine going back to the voters in a couple of years and say, well, we talked about fixing our regulatory issues in the United States, so we talked about fixing our health care, but we didn't get around to it. Well, that's not gonna happen. We're going to move forward with changes we think are the right thing to do, uh, do them as well as we can, I doubt everything would be perfect. Unfortunately, not everything is, but you know, you move forward and you take what you can and keep moving forward in the direction that we need to move this country. Okay, Congressman, good luck. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. That was my conversation with Republican Congressman from Michigan, Paul Mitchell, earlier today. We're coming to you live from the balcony of the Canadian Embassy in Washington, the Capitol building just behind me, but let's look way down to the other end of the National Mall here in Washington, D.C. This is the Make America Great Again rally uh, just outside the Lincoln Memorial. You can see there over the shoulder of the conductor, Donald Trump and his entire family taking part in that celebration, one of many inaugural events uh, starting today and, of course, kicking off in earnest tomorrow. The president-elect expected to uh, speak to the thousands of people gathered there on the mall at some point, and we'll bring that to you live. Souvenir shops are getting in, of course, on the action of the inauguration of Donald Trump. I took a look at some of the unique souvenirs on display in D.C. We'll show you some of the key items after this short break. Stick around. Um, the sweatshirts here that you see on the table for the inaugural, them are big sellers. This is our second time stocking this table. You know, what I, you know what I like? I like the magnet with the hair attached to it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people buy that because they be trying to, and then they're sitting here trying to plait the hair and say, he really don't have this much hair. And I just be laughing. I was like, oh, man. <laughs>
So you, you you voted for Mr. Trump? Yes, we did. All right. How do you how are you feeling about tomorrow? I'm very excited about tomorrow. I'm very excited to hear his speech. I I think he's going to have Woo! a very Trump. I think he's going to have a very unifying speech, and I think he's going to mean it, and I think he's going to act on it. Donald Trump's inauguration just uh, hours well many hours, but hours away, as you heard. People in the Capitol are very excited. We're here at the Canadian Embassy, right uh, near the Capitol building, of course, where Donald Trump will make his inaugural speech tomorrow. And the CBC's chief correspondent, Peter Mansbridge, is also here. He'll ha host, of course, our special coverage tomorrow and uh, host the National here tonight and tomorrow. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's, you know, it's fascinating to listen to that fellow, the Trump supporter, and they're all over town. Yep. And you don't have to walk very far to bump into them, and they're not shy. No, they're not. About how they no, feel. And uh, their moment has come. But at the, uh, at the same time, you see this, and uh, uh, you don't just see it here. We even, you know, we see it in our country, other countries as well. That moment where somebody who you never thought of as a president or a prime minister yep. suddenly is about to become one. Yep. And it's a whole different tone to them. And, uh, you know, Trump caught both tones today. You saw him in that little kind of impromptu speech he gave to a bunch of supporters where he talked about his cabinet picks, was bragging about how smart they are and the total IQs more than anybody. The normal kind of Trump bomb blast that we've got, got used to over the, over the last uh, year or two. And then, you know, uh, n not many uh, moments away from that moment, you see him saluting you know, the guard as yep. he got off the plane. And then you saw him at Arlington uh, National Cemetery where he, he looked presidential in the moment. You know, and then tomorrow we're going to see him up there in front of the Capitol building giving that inaugural address. And what can be more presidential than that? How he'll pull it off? What it'll be like? Will he be the bomb blast guy or will he be the presidential guy? Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But you mm. also talked to the ambassador. Uh, you talked to him at length, but yeah. some of it aired last night. Yeah. What did he tell you about the potential of a visit? Because traditionally that has been the thing. The U.S. president comes up and sees Canada. What, what's the likelihood well, I told of that? you more. I mean, <laughs> he made it pretty clear. Uh, to you um, and to me that, you know, they, they were working on it. It wasn't yeah. top of mind for him. He's, he's a negotiator. They were trying to get other things done. But I, I get the sense that if there's going to be this trip, but A, as he said to you, it's not clear which where way? it's going to be, yeah. which way it's going to be. But I think if it comes, if it's, it's in Canada, I don't think it's going to be Ottawa. I think they're going to look for a different kind of setting. Really? And play to his kind of business. Well. Angle. Bay Street, kind of Toronto. Could be Bay yeah. Street, you know, could be Windsor. Could be Calgary. Could, could be Calgary, yeah. you know, they're, they're, but that's, a, that's kind of a hunch that the, hmm. they're looking at, at something different. But, it, you know, it's interesting to listen to the Canadians because they're trying hard to make an impact sure. with a group who are, you know, Canada's not top of mind for them. Let's face it, it, it never, never has been. And they, some of them don't really know a lot about. Yeah what's at stake uh, in this relationship right now. And so they're trying to, uh, you know, politely explain the positions and try to break through on that on that level. So it, the, when I was talking to all those people today, the other mm -hmm. thing that s struck me as similar to what happened has happened in our country is the expectations game. Because those people, those Trump supporters, they have very high expectations for him. Sure do. Based on what he said. So I would wonder what does he have to say tomorrow to reassure them and then reassure the people yeah. who feel excluded from this presidency. And that is, and those are two very different sets of people. Right. And, and how you satisfy both of them is a real challenge, especially the latter group who are staked in. 200,000 of them at least are going to be here to march on, on, on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, he has to show those who, who supported him that he is going to deliver on some of the things that he's promised uh, right away. He's got he's got this place all locked up, both houses of Congress. So he, he should be able to do that. Uh, which ones that he'll say that are going to happen, you know, within the hundred days. But the other one's much tougher. Yeah. You know how you divide, uh, heal a you know a divided nation is tough, and how you convince them that you're going to do it. And it's obviously not just the crowd here, uh, you know, and there'll be a few, few hundred thousand here tomorrow. Um, not the two million that we saw when, when Obama was uh, inaugurated in, in 09, but 
it's it's those people who will be watching on television. You know, how are you going to make us feel a part of this? That's really going to be difficult, given all the things he said, um, all the times he's had an opportunity to reach out and hasn't. You know, it's funny on election night, yeah. and you watch that, yeah. he reached out, yeah. and you thought, wow, there there is a different guy, and almost since that moment, it's been the old guy. Yeah. What's it going to be tomorrow? And if he really wrote it himself, what's that going to sound like? Yeah. Well, as the speechwriters like to say, you know, they download their thoughts to us, and then we try to oh, massage okay. it into a word. <laughs> so really, it's their, it's their speech. All right. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, you can watch Peter uh, later tonight, of course, on The National, and he'll host our special coverage, which starts at 10. And you'll be there, too. Okay, good just so I know what time to show up. Yeah. Special live coverage starts with Heather Hiscox at 6 a.m. and our chief correspondent takes over at 10 a.m. Eastern on CBC Television, CBC News Network, and of course online to cbcnews.ca. Okay, so the inauguration is expected to boost the local economy by almost a billion dollars just in and around here. I checked out one of the places where a new president means big business. Take a look. Be busy. Busy not even a word. This is nothing. If you come here Friday, you probably won't even be able to get in the door. Did you come up for the inauguration? Came up for the inauguration. Right. To so see you, President you voted Trump? for the, the new president? Absolutely. I'm pretty a progressive Democrat, but I love the Trumps and I think they're gonna do a good job. The top sellers are the bobbleheads for Trump and the sweatshirts here that you see on the table. We are from the Panhandle of Texas. Tell her the name. Canadian. No. <laughs> yeah, really? Canadian Texas. We're on the Canadian River. I'm getting shirts for myself and my husband and my son-in-law. An inauguration came with both of their pictures on it. We were ready for a change. One, two, three. Cheese. 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 We voted. Yes, we did. And you're Trump. And you're not worried about anything like that. You oh, know. you know, it's not perfect, but nobody's perfect. This is the table where political dreams go to die, the clearance section. Lots of Hillary Clinton shirts. Hillary Clinton 2016, that didn't work out. And even wear some of the anti-Trump t-shirts. No one's buying those either. We are continuing to pray, continuing to pray and stand and believe. So that, that's why we're here. He's a leader. He finds good people, but don't push him around. He is not going to back down. Just give him a chance. Yeah. We'll see. Drain the swamp. And That's after it. four years, you know, if he's not good, we'll vote for somebody else. Okay, let's take you back live to the Welcome concert taking place just outside the Lincoln Memorial here in Washington at the other end of the National Mall from where I am, Donald Trump, and his whole family in attendance to celebrate a historic moment in his life and perhaps in American history too. Trump's been having a great old time singing along with some of the uh, performers and enjoying the beginning of uh, an incredible couple of days that will be here in Washington. The celebrations have already started. Uh, we'll talk more about what it means for Canada and the United States after this short break. Power panel sticking, coming by. Stockwell Day will be right here beside me. Stick around. And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. Sing it. God bless the USA.
Hey, welcome back to our special edition of Power and Politics, live from the balcony of the Canadian Embassy in Washington, D.C., actually just right outside the ambassador's office. Earlier today, though, Canada's former prime minister, Stephen Harper, uh, made some public comments, really perhaps his first public comments since leaving office. In this case, he made them about a tr Trump presidency and how he thinks it will change global politics. Take a listen to him. He is going to reject and reverse the idea that the United States has an overarching responsibility for global affairs. I believe the U.S. under Trump will focus squarely on America's vital national interests, narrowly defined, especially its economic interests. This is going to take us into a world we have not known in eight decades, a world devoid of one or two dominating powers, and the risks of that of that unknown are significant. The United States will cease to view the rise of China as essentially benign. Okay, so let's see what the power panel thinks of this on the, uh, just before Trump's swearing in, and we'll dig into all the issues that will matter to us as well. In Calgary tonight, Susan Smith of Blue Sky Strategy Group. In the Ottawa studio, holding down the fort for me, Kathleen Monk of Ernst Cliff Strategy Group and Bloomberg's Josh Wingrove. I'm glad neither of you have taken my chair. I appreciate that. I tried. <laughs> I know you did. And here with me in Washington, D.C., former Conservative Cabinet Minister Stockwell Day. Good to see everybody. Good to see you. Okay, I'm going to start with Stockwell because he's here, and, and that's your guy, Stephen Harper. Um, what, what, why do you think he made those comments now, and what do you make of them? I think he crystallized in a very succinct way two things that not just Americans, but that the world will be seeing emerge for sure. Mm. And uh, meeting today with key people in uh, the president elect's administration, without them seeing those comments, that's exactly what they are articulating. It's all about the U.S., it's all about jobs, reducing taxes, and keeping spending down. But it's very much a concern about getting involved in too many foreign engagements. And clearly, they have, uh, he has, Mr. Trump has, concerns related to China. So these are strong signals. They're also points of opportunity for Canada. Points of opportunity, but also uh, potential causes of concern. Um, take China, for instance. Um, I, like, if we see Donald Trump and the Trump administration pull away from China, and we've certainly seen signals of that, Susan, how does a Trudeau government respond to that? Anyway, you, I mean, you can dig in on that and, and what you thought of what Mr. Harper had to say. Sure. Um, in terms of what Mr. Harper had to say, I agree with him. I, I, people might be surprised at that. I agree with what he said. I think he, I think he did say what people have been thinking and and have been saying all along about the Trump administration. These are very, very clearly the signals that Mr. Trump and his administration has been sending. I think the uh, Trudeau appointment of Mc uh, John McCallum as ambassador to China yeah. uh, is even more prescient when it comes to that. He, uh, uh, in the sense of anticipating the, the actual deployment of Mr. Trump's uh, attitude towards China. It's one thing for him to be talking about it, but he takes the reins of power tomorrow. So he'll have the chance to put it all into action. It matters that we have someone like John McCallum, who has the ear of the prime minister, who the Chinese government view as um, an important ambassador on behalf of our country. And I think that will help Canada-Chinese relations. The other thing I think that the Trudeau government has done uh, with the appointment of Christia Freeland as our new foreign affairs minister, and then the appointment this week of and former Lieutenant General Andrew Leslie as the parliamentary secretary to um, Minister Freeland, and also with special responsibilities for Canada-US. That's another signal that the government, the Canadian government, is looking to be able to adjust and pivot to what's going on globally in response to the, the new yeah. Trump approach. Andy Leslie, with all of his foreign affairs experience as a military officer in the field, in working with um, American generals, but also working with countries around the world, um, will be able to bring some additional valuable insights and geopolitical, you know, geopolitical knowledge. He'll, he'll get how the chess pieces will move around. Yeah, and I mean, he, he would know lots of the generals that yeah. Trump has appointed to lots of yeah. positions. And he and the defense minister, Christia Freeland, and our minister of natural resources are actually down here for the inauguration or will be down here as of tomorrow. So, Kathleen, it, given what Stephen Harper has said, um, I, I don't start with whether you agree with it, but how should we respond to that? Well, like Susan, I, um, I think his analysis is really interesting. Um, I found it interesting that this is the first time really in 14 months, actually the first time since the election in 2015, we've seen 
such a dramatic statement, um, an analytical statement from Stephen Harper, really. I mean, I know he came out to endorse uh, Jason Kenney, but he's been largely silent. So it's interesting that it comes out at this moment. He spoke a lot about um, wh what the U.S. position would be, but not how Canada should be re reacting, and not at least in the segments that I've seen or the transcript I read. So I'm interested in, to kind of pick out what he thinks, how, how Canada should respond. I agree with mm -hmm. much of what Susan said in terms of um, the appointment of McCallum was uh, very smart. Uh, it, to, it signals to the Chinese that, you know, that the new ambassador of China does have the prime minister's ear. I also think another um, smart move that was done over a year ago was the prime minister Minister's office appointment of the ambassador you just actually interviewed, uh, uh, Rosie. Um, very prescient. Um, I can actually was um, done with this possibility of a contingency of a, a possible Trump win. And McNaughton now is looking really um, like the guiding light in D.C. He's got a good sense about politics and how to move in that city. And actually, will probably end up being very much a guiding light for many ambassadors who are on the ground in Washington trying to figure out what's happening there with the new administration. Okay, Josh, last word to you. Uh, Stephen Harper, uh, in my experience, and I'm sure yours in stocks as well, do doesn't say things for, for that are unmotivated. He, when he speaks, it's because he wants uh, people to listen. And if he chose now, I would imagine it's because he, he wanted that message to resonate in some way. And he made the comments in India, by the way, in case people didn't know. Well, I was just going to say India has always yeah. been kind of a special relationship for him. He made uh, quite complimentary comments as well today in the speech saying that he thinks if Trump targets China, India is going to be in a good position, might be in a position to sort of emerge as a new partner either of the U.S. or elsewhere. But he had some other comments that I think are worth noting that weren't in the highlight pack and speaking sort of not to Trump specifically and the impact on Canada, but more broadly to the wave that brought Trump in and sort of a, and the wave that brought Brexit in. He connected those two, which I think a lot of people, of course, have connected, and said that he thinks that multilateral trade deals are dead because of this kind of thing. We're going to have more bilateral trade deals and that uh, politicians aren't doing a good enough job of uh, relaying the effects and benefits of globalization down the ladder. He said he thinks that the elites, if you will, uh, the sort of establishment is just going about this sort of increasingly multilateral uh, sort of, uh, you know, multi uh, complex trading world environment without really bothering to involve people uh, like the voters who put them there, and he thinks that that is uh, that is a problem. I think it was it was an insight from uh, both the perspective of a guy who's been a G7 leader for yeah. nearly a decade, and who's led a political coalition that includes a lot of fairly right-leaning voters. Uh, and so he had some other comments about how to maintain support for immigration, as well. He said that if Canada had people flooding across the border like the U.S. does across the southern border, that we would not have the support for immigration that we have here. So I I, I would really encourage anyone, whether you like Stephen Harper or not. To go watch his speech, I thought it was—I thought it was a good one. Yeah. The okay. one thing I might say, yeah. Rosie, very quickly, yeah. is Stephen Harper is now a private citizen. He has to make his living, um, speaking, uh, being on boards, as a consultant. And by emerging now, he's also reminding potential clients that he is a conservative. He can speak to conservatives down in in uh, Trump's. Uh, Washington. Yep. Exactly. There may be a bit of client business development yeah. going on with a speech Definitely. like that too. Well, you know, why not? No, no, <laughs> Every, it's fair. Everybody's got to make a living. Him. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll power okay. to him. I, I'm going to show you one more shot of the uh, the welcome concert taking place uh, outside the Lincoln Memorial, and uh, say what you will about the politics, whether you like them or not. But uh, Washington knows how to put on a good show. Sheesh, it's uh, it's pretty spectacular to watch. Uh, the Lincoln Memorial lit up in a concert happening outside. We're going to take a short break. More power panel. We'll dig into uh, trade and some of what Kathleen was talking about there. What our ambassador David McNaughton could bring to that conversation after this break. Stay there. We have all been witness to a very grueling year and a half for the president-elect. We have been witnessed to a barrage of propaganda that left us all breathless with anticipation, not knowing if God could reverse all the negative lies against Mr. Trump.
Hey, welcome back to Power and Politics live from Washington, D.C. The Power Panel scattered in our studio back in Ottawa, Calgary, and here beside me, Stockwell Day. We're keeping our eye as well on the Make America Great Again uh, concert taking place on the National Mall outside the Lincoln Memorial. The president-elect is supposed to say a few words, so we will stand by and bring that to you if and when he does. Now, Kathleen sort of alluded to this, right? She doesn't get to start. Um, and Susan did as well. So uh, let me let me bring in Stockwell maybe on this about um, David McNaughton, the ambassador to the United States. You said you've been talking to a bunch of people here today, Stockwell. What are they telling you? If any, I'm sure they don't. Canada is not top of mind for them. But what are they advising or saying about how Canada needs to approach the, these trade talks, this new administration? What's the, what's the word well, on the street? Sure, that is the great question. And uh, meeting with a number of people within the new administration who are talking about that. Yeah. And what's interesting, and this isn't new, uh, one thing that everybody says about the president-elect, the word pragmatic is top of mind all the time. And so they're telling us when we're talking about trade situations, what's going to happen with energy, what's going to happen with agriculture, yeah. they say, listen, you bring a strategy, you bring something, sure, I know it has to work for Canada, but you bring something that has something to do with jobs in the U.S., with helping keep costs down in the U.S., and you're going to get the attention of who will be the new president and his administration. So the farm groups are meeting with, uh, the, 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 the law groups. I mean, everybody is here. People are saying Washington's a zoo right now. Yeah. It's actually, as you've sort of reflected, it's more like Disneyland right, right now. Yeah. Everybody's here. Everybody wants a ticket. But those are the things. Bring us what is pragmatic and solution-oriented, and you're going to get in here. That, uh, Josh, you, you weigh in on that because you cover business, and, and, and I th I, that's what I've been hearing, too, is that if you can make a case for, for the United States, why, we're, why Canada is useful to the United States, then you might be on a winning track when it comes to this president. Well, and that's what Justin Trudeau, I think, has tried to do with Mr. McNaughton by sending Christia Freeland down there before he'd even bothered appointing her as foreign minister, uh, by sending Gerald Butts and Katie Telford down there. They're trying to get in on the ground floor. And I think that's smart in part because you talk about getting in there and making a case to who. There are reports that he has not... Uh, Mr. Trump has not put in place the vast majority of the staff that, that typically would be in place at this point in time. He's going to carry over some Obama officials that he's previously criticized some of them. His own nominees, as their hearings are going on, are frequently contradicting him on his own policy. So I don't know who you would bring it to. If you're a farmer, do you go to the, 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 the nominee? Uh, rural America, by the way, is upset, but Trump has been ignoring them and dragging his heels and appointing an agriculture secretary. Like, I don't know uh, where, I don't know which ride I'd line up at at Disneyland, to put it that way, I think, right now. Which is, which, so I think Trudeau is smart to get in on the ground floor. I think the Taiwan situation with Mr. Trump showed that, like, if you get in early, you can have pretty dramatic uh, effects. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, think, I, think, I think that if uh, ultimately Canada needs to, as you say, position it as America first. Every day goes by, we see new warning signs that could affect Canada, whether it's oil, whether it's autos, whether it's just NAFTA broadly. Like the, you know, and any, anyone I think who says they have certainty on those, and perhaps Mr. Day and others can correct me, I, I, I think is being a little overconfident, because what, what we don't know is when Trump will wake up and decide that Canada is a problem, or if he ever will. Right, I well, think and Josh is, yeah. yeah, go ahead, yep. I think Josh is right, Rosemary. Uh, and this is what Minister Freeland and McNaughton and the Prime Minister, you know, via the video that they've done, um, have been trying to do. They've been trying to set the, do their own inoculation and, and plant in the minds of new legislators, new congressmen, existing senators, the importance of the Canada-U.S. trade relationship. Um, 33, 34, 35, the number moves around a little bit, the states. In the U.S., their number one trading partner is Canada. That's jobs with auto, with agriculture, with energy, oil and gas. I spoke to someone, I'm out in here in Calgary, I spoke with someone today who told me, you know, they have hundreds of jobs just in the state of Ohio alone. Mm. And I think this new administration isn't necessarily as acutely aware of the, uh, the level of integration between our two economies. So um, while I agree with Josh that all of those people aren't necessarily in place in the White House, there are congressmen and things like that that they can yeah. identify by virtue of where they've been elected and start to do that because I do think well, Mr. Trump figures it out and some of his people figure it out, they'll at some point have to listen to some of the noises out of Congress if the, if the congressional people are saying, hey, look, you can't do that. You're going to kill jobs in my district. Um, that's what will make a difference. And that will help us. It doesn't mean we're going to win on every battle with the Americans. No. But I think it's, 
it, it's going to be helpful in terms of the conversations when it comes to NAFTA and trade. I wonder, I wonder, Kathleen, how much that of that though then is about Canadians educating um, Americans about what what you know the relationship or what the value of that relationship. Yeah, and I think that's really important. I think the ambassador has said that it's not just about duck and cover and hopefully that we don't face Trump's uh, wrath. He, he's actually actively out there and seeking to educate um, Congress and the president and the new administration as a whole um, about Canada and the value of Canada, like Susan said. I think that one thing we can take when we step back and we look at Trump, who he is as a man, he, what, what his character is. You know, as a businessman, he's very transactional in nature. And so it's safe to assume that he will want some early wins. We know from the last few months, from being elected uh, till now to his inauguration uh, tomorrow, he has taken credit for various things, from the carrier deal to others, right? He likes to have wins in his pocket. And we know from the witness hearings, the hearings about uh, nominations uh, with Wilbur Ross and others, the Commerce Secretary, that um, they're not necessarily going to focus on Canada, but they are going to issue that letter about ripping up NAFTA probably in yeah. the next few days. We know that's coming. Coming, right? So the best way to position ourselves is to get out there, right, and to start working with them, which is exactly what the ambassador is doing. Because, you know, the other thing is about politics, you know, and Josh makes a very good point. Staffing up is really, really, really hard. And we know that he doesn't have um, the undersecretary, undersecretaries and the assistant secretaries in place. So yeah. a lot of those vacancies. So if we can deliver on a plate, you know, our team deliver on a plate, you know, a win for him, an early win in some language yeah. about yeah. what we want that's going to be helpful. Rosie, I, I do think that yeah. one thing, one of our biggest things that we might need to do to adjust to Trump won't have anything to do with David McNaughton, and that is reacting to stuff that he does strictly domestically. Stephen Polaz, the Bank of Canada governor, warned about this yesterday. If he cuts taxes, for instance, do we do the same? You know, he's mm. probably not moving on climate. Do we slow down the carbon price? I mean, a, a lot of the impact would be from an angle of a comparative disadvantage of stuff flowing south out of Canada. Sure, because the sure, climate but, is better yeah, there. but you can't, as the Prime Minister has said, uh, you can't make policy in, in Canada just because uh, the Americans don't like it or it's not going to work. Stockwell, get, you no, get the last and word. You, and, and you don't have to. And uh, to Kathleen's uh, good point, and someone's already mentioned, these are early days. But in fact, we do know many of the people that are either in place right now or are going to be in place. I uh, met with some of them today, and, and full disclosure, uh, uh, Rosie, which I know you always uh, insist <laughs> on, I am here also doing yeah, uh, business yeah. with, with Macmillan, and, and we have actually contacted people, and you will be, I think we've got some pleasant surprise, I don't want to raise expectations here, but some key people in the administration who have already indicated, yes, set up something in Ottawa, set up something in Calgary or Vancouver, right. I will be there, and I will speak as closely as I can on behalf of the new president, they're already saying this. They want to articulate these views. They want to engage Canada. I will say the uh, our ambassador, uh, McNaughton, uh, is doing a phenomenal job in terms of linking people together. He's well known here, not just because of this beautiful location that's, that's right behind us, but he and his staff are doing an amazing job. And I was just in a reception with Newt Gingrich, and I can tell you, for what you see sometimes on the political front, where people say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a Democrat, I'm not going to talk to anybody in the Trump administration, I want to tell you, that reception where Newt Gingrich is, it is loaded with Democrats. Huh. And not in kind of a callous way. They're there saying, you know what, we all have to live together, we have to work together. They've got constituents who want jobs, they want to know yeah. what Canada's doing, and uh, this thing is moving along with some uh, significant velocity. Can, and can we Rosie, just all pause for a moment and admire how good Stockwell looks with the Capitol uh, building behind him? <laughs> It takes, it takes a Capitol building to make me look good. And this is not Peter Manbridge's ja Man jacket. Uh, we do have some no, similar... No, but, uh, but it is his chair. So well, anyway, okay, we're going to take another short break with the power panel. We'll all admire Stockwell here in his beautiful setting. And uh, that is, of course, what's happening down at the other end of the National Mall. We're waiting, hopefully, to hear from the president-elect. All that and more after this break. Stay there. I would like you to pay a tribute to the courage...
concert. And then we had the idea, maybe we'll do it in front of the Lincoln Memorial. I don't know if it's ever been done before, but if it has, very seldom. And the people came by the thousands and thousands, and here we are tonight, all the way back. All the way back. So it's a movement that began. It's a movement that started. And it's a movement like we've never seen anywhere in the world, they say. There's never been a movement like this. And it's something very, very special. And we're going to unify our country. And our phrase, you all know it, you're half of you are wearing the hat, make America great again. But we're going to make America great for all of our people, everybody, everybody throughout our country. That includes the inner cities. That includes everybody. And we're going to do a special job. And I can only tell you that 18 months ago, we never knew. A lot of people didn't know. Some people had a feeling. A lot of people didn't give us much of a chance, but we understood what was happening. And that last month of the campaign, when I traveled around to every place that you can imagine, state after state after state, speech after speech, and we had 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people. There was never an empty seat, just like tonight. We didn't know if anybody would even come tonight. This hasn't been done before. And you look, it was the same way. And we all knew that last month of the campaign. I think a lot of us knew the first week of the campaign. But that last month of the campaign, we knew that something special was happening. And I can only tell you this. The polls started going up, 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 but they didn't want to give us credit because they forgot about a lot of us. On the campaign, I called it the forgotten man and the forgotten woman. Well, you're not forgotten anymore, that I can tell you. Not forgotten anymore. So I want to thank my great family, my incredible wife, Melania. They've been so supportive, and it wasn't easy for them, but they have been so supportive. I want to thank you, most importantly, and I promise you that I will work so hard we're going to get it turned around. We're going to bring our jobs back. We're not going to let other countries take our jobs any longer. We're going to build up our great military. We're going to build it up. We're going to strengthen our borders. We're going to do things that haven't been done for our country for many, many decades. It's going to change. I promise you, it's going to change. So, I'll see you tomorrow. And I don't care, frankly, if it's going to be beautiful or if it's going to rain like crazy. Makes no difference to me. I have a feeling it's going to be beautiful. But I will see you tomorrow, and I'm going to be cheering you on. You're going to cheer me on, but I'm going to be cheering you on, because what we've done is so special. All over the world, they're talking about it. All over the world. And I love you folks, and we're going to work together. And we are going to make America great again, and I'll add, greater than ever before. Thank you very much, and enjoy the fireworks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
All right, there you go. On the eve of his inaugural address, the president-elect taking the stage and um, thanking the supporters that have shown up there and telling them to show up tomorrow. Uh, so maybe that is a bit of foreshadowing of what we're going to hear in the speech uh, tomorrow. I'll do one quick go-round with the power panel and their thoughts before I let them all head off. Stockwell, what, what did you make of uh, what the president-elect said there? Well, that comment and basically anything he comments on, uh, I don't think Rosemary people have, or a lot of people haven't fully comprehended how completely uh, this president-elect has altered the universe of communication. Because, I mean, he can be criticized for the tweets, but... Um, you know, he gets his messages out direct. This is a brand new paradigm. It's like the when the when the smartphone hit in 2007, everything changed. Mm -hmm. And when he says something about the U.S. dollar, it can move up or down. The markets are like they never were before. When he says something about the Mexican economy, the peso can drop. When he says something about jobs, he gets calls from huge multinational companies saying they want to invest in Texas, they want to invest in Oregon, or wherever it might be. So. Uh, this is a new paradigm. Some people don't like it, but this is, I don't know if it's the way of the future for every leader, but this is going to be the way forward for this president-elect. He's going to say things, they're going to have some significance, people are going to listen, and there will be consequences of the things he says. Whether he can do it is another uh, issue, and I know from the people that I've talked to on the street today, I'll get you to weigh in first, Kathleen. They, they do want to hear messages of unity. So that message that he said that uh, he wants to make Mer America great again for all our people, I, I thought, you know, whether he does it, I don't know, but it's an important thing for him to say. Yeah, certainly the tone with tonight was more similar to uh, election night where he had yeah. that, that lovely concession speech that was more about uniting people. I think, don't, don't underestimate that this is a man who understands TV, he understands stagecraft. Um, Previous presidents have as well. Ronald Reagan, remember, uh, did in fact build um, a TV studio within the White House uh, in order to kind of bypass the mainstream media to go directly to some of the local channels. Um, and, and, and in some ways, Trump is bypassing the media now to go through Twitter. I think that, you know, tonight's event, the way that it was, the Lincoln Memorial was lit, I mean, it could have been out of a Mark Burnett TV show. So it's going to be interesting to watch tomorrow how his inauguration plays out and, and what his presidency brings. Susan, your thoughts on what he had to say there and whether that's what we should expect tomorrow? Well, he sounded, I didn't have the visual because I'm sitting here in, in lovely Calgary, but he sounded tired already to me. I'm glad there was a unifying message. He was, you know, had some trouble with the truth there. He's not the first president to do a concert in front of the Lincoln Memorial. There was a huge one with Barack Obama with big name uh, people attending and supporting him. I think it's all about the expectation management has begun, though. Um, yeah. There, there won't be millions in support of the, at the inauguration tomorrow. There'll be hundreds of thousands, but not millions like there were for Obama. There'll be protests where there weren't the similar kinds of protests um, when, when Obama was inaugurated. I hope the man is able to contain his inner voices and keep them from transcending to his thumbs and Twitter, and I hope he learns to govern and learns to have a real sense of the impact. He has an obligation to bring the American people together, and I think that that's good for that country, and it's good for the rest of the world if he can do it. Josh? I think that expectations management piece is huge. and I don't think he has a long leash on it. I think that he has pledged nothing short of a total overhaul of not only government, but the American economy. And I think that the voters that supported him, particularly you think about people who you know want a manufacturing job back, for instance, uh, are going to get pretty frustrated pretty quick when uh, they realize that a, fix, a quick fix that he's pledged uh, might be tougher than he thought. So I think that uh, Donald Trump looks like he's having fun usually. He seems to enjoy being in the spotlight, but yeah. going forward, I I think that the job this is a tough job, and uh, I think I think it's going to be tough for him. And uh, they're standing there, his whole family, in front of the Lincoln Memorial, just down at the other end of the National Mall. Donald Trump seems a bit overwhelmed, actually, there. He actually is one of the Bibles he will use tomorrow for uh, when he is sworn in as president. It will be the Bible of Abraham Lincoln, also used by President Barack Obama. Okay, the fireworks are happening. Wow, look at that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Man, I tell you, the United States knows how to put on a show. Uh, we'll keep an eye on things as they unfold there. Thank you to the Power Panel. Stockwell Day here with me, Susan Smith in Calgary, Kathleen Monk and Josh Wingrove holding down the fort in Ottawa. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Thanks. Rosie. So, I think we've established that the Canada-U.S. relationship will change under the new president. Look at those spectacular pictures. We're going to have two well-known Republicans standing by to give us their view on what may lay ahead. Stay around. More after this.
All right. This is uh, the president-elect, his wife Melania, and his entire family, his children, their spouses, some of their children as they leave the Lincoln Memorial that uh, is at the other end of Capitol Hill from where the president will give his inaugural address tomorrow morning um, or tomorrow afternoon, lunchtime. If you've never been there before, it's uh, right beside the Vietnam Memorial and is a, uh, a real stunning memorial to uh, the man that was um, so instrumental to making the United States what it is today. We'll see where Donald Trump brings it. We are broadcasting you live uh, from the balcony of the Canadian Embassy here, of course, in Washington, D.C. And when the president-elect takes his oath of office tomorrow, Republicans will be in charge of the White House and both branches of Congress for the first time since George W. Bush's administration. So what will all of this mean for us? Because we like to ask that question. How should the government position itself to deal with a Republican Congress and presidency? And what are some of the concerns that, uh, that could happen globally with a President Trump in charge? I put that question earlier today to the former U.S. Ambassador to Canada, David Wilkins, and former Bush speechwriter, now senior editor of The Atlantic magazine, David Frum. Thank you for joining me. Good to see you both. Um, I'll start with you, Mr. Wilkins. How are you feeling about the, the big day, the inauguration day, and about Trump becoming president? Uh, I'm hopeful. I think uh, many, many Americans across our nation are very hopeful. They're, they're, uh, they're looking for a president that's going to emphasize jobs, uh, roll back some of the draconian uh, regulations we've seen in the last uh, eight years, the job-killing regulations. Uh, Prove KXL. I think I think they're looking for a change and they're looking for results. And you got a Republican legislature, a Republican mm -hmm. executive branch now, and so I think next hundred days things are going to happen and we're going to get positive results and the economy is going to improve because of it. Are you, are you as hopeful? I hope for the best, but I think it's important to prepare for the worst. Uh, the best is just as, as the ambassador said that um, I, there. I think there's going to be some very stimulative economic uh, legislation passed. Um, you know, that uh, the, the economy will be deregulated and taxes will be reduced and that will work as it always does. Um, at the same time, you have to prepare for the worst, which is um, this is going to be um, probably a very scandal-plagued administration. They're setting out the predicates for it now. Uh, it's going to be a very untransparent uh, administration which regards the press with tremendous hostility. But the biggest worry um, is what is going to happen to America's system of global leadership and alliance structures, which are under tremendous uh, pressure. Um, and uh, the question marks and, and beyond question marks uh, over those relationships really trouble me. Okay, so let's talk about the first 100 days then. What are the things that, I mean, I know he's got his list of what he could do in 100 days, but, and he's got uh, obviously Congress on his side, but what legitimately are the things that the president could do in the first 100 days that, that would, you know, to show Americans that he's really going to do well, something? Well, the first same. five days, he's going to issue a number of executive orders that yeah. repeal the Obama executive orders. You know, President Obama uh, passed or signed more challenged executive orders than any other president in history. A lot of them in the Supreme Court right now usurping the legislative power by signing executive orders. And so he's going to repeal those. They deal with immigration. Uh, they deal with guns. They deal with a number of things. And so that's a, that'll be done probably in the first week of the administration. And then you've got, uh, obviously, Obamacare. Yeah. Uh, you've got tax reform. I had uh, attended a breakfast this morning with uh, Chairman Orrin Hatch, and he talked about those things. I think there's going to be an awful lot of cooperation from the Republican-controlled House and Senate. And so I, I look for tax reform, lowering corporate tax, a repeal of Obamacare, um, repeal of uh, certain uh, job-killing EPA regulations. Um, right now, as, as we speak, mm -hmm. um, an American armored brigade is deploying in Poland. Um, Canadians are going to Latvia, as you know. Germans are taking up positions in Lithuania, British and French in Estonia. This is the biggest arms buildup um, by NATO on the European con uh, continent since the Cold War. Um, and uh, it is there to protect um, that forward tier of NATO um, from the ever more aggressive actions of Russia. There's a shooting war going on in Ukraine. Uh, 12,000 people probably killed since the Russian invasion in 2014. Tens of thousands hurt, a million probably displaced. That is happening at the same time as the administration here is signaling total lack of resolve on the defense of uh, the Western alliance. Um, and the, at, the, at the same time as the American-German relationship, which is the central artery of NATO, is under pressure such as we've never seen. Mm -hmm. So what So what? What might happen then in the first 100 days on that front? I mean, we've heard him musing about things, but what could he actually do? Pull them out? Well, no, that's that's a big project. I mean, even to um, 
you can't pull out an armored division, no. <laughs> right, armored brigade in a hundred yeah. days. Um, uh, what he, uh, but what the Trump people are doing is they are forming um, behind the curtain arrangements and alliances, not with friendly governments, mm. but with anti-system parties in all of these countries. So there's a back channel between the Trump administration and the National Front in France, um, back channels with some pretty marginal figures in the UK. We don't know what they're doing inside Germany, but pr um, President-elect Trump, President-to-be Trump, um, has uh, delivered some pretty blistering criticisms yes. of Angela Merkel, and that's a very important relationship. By the way, not all the criticisms are false. They're just things that president shouldn't say. Do you, uh, you, you're talking a lot about domestic things, and I understand that's where your focus is, yeah. but does any of that worry you what? in terms of the United States becoming a destabilizing force in the world? I think just the opposite, and I oh. have great respect for my friend David Frum, but uh, <laughs> He's a little negative, I'm more positive uh, on this front. I, I think he's gonna restore um, American uh, respect in the world. Uh, he's gonna be respectful of our friends like Canada, like Israel, uh, which the Obama administration, in my opinion, has not been on occasion. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, think he's gonna, I think he's gonna restore us to the level we were before, uh, the Obama administration. I, uh, uh, I, I hear the concerns, but if you heard the testimony of many of the national security uh, yeah. appointees yesterday, uh, I think you'd get reassured that they plan on the U.S. standing up to Russia, taking Russia very seriously, the Russian aggression, and, and making sure that NATO is a part of that uh, opposition and be part of NATO. And so I, I don't have the negativity that my friend David has. On this. <laughs> You've got a bifurcated administration. So yes. the cabinet appointees, our foreign policy cabinet appointees, are relatively normal people. General Mattis, obviously, expressing very traditional Atlanticist views on the alliance, and of course he's a very impressive figure, one of the most impressive military uh, men of, of his generation. Um, we're hearing more or less uh, reassuring noises from the incoming Secretary of State, yeah. Rex Tillerson. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, former Governor Nikki Haley of South, South Carolina, the Ambassador of State, um, has said you know very reassuring things about the UN. But remember, the administ administration makes its foreign policy not just in the departments, but also at the White House through the mechanism of the National yeah. Security Council, which is not Senate confirmed. Um, and the appointments there are vary between worrying and alarming, and in some cases alarming in the extreme, like General Flynn, the head of the National Security uh, Council, who um, took money from Russian state propaganda and sat beside Vladimir Putin um, at uh, the anniversary dinner for Russian state propaganda mm -hmm. and who has this very worrying back channel with the Russian ambassador to the United States. So, you know, because it's we're in Canada and we want to know about us, um, I've had some interesting conversations with a variety of ambassadors up in Canada, Latvia, Ukraine, and others, who really see Canada as a potential country that could come to the United States, the administration, and say, hey, just wanted to remind you of this. Uh, these guys are having some concerns. Do, do you see that we would be able to have that kind of role um, for this new administration, that we could sort of remind them of the importance of some of these alliances? I think Canada always can play an important role. And yeah. when I was a U.S. ambassador to Canada, uh, I can tell you that th their opinion counted. And they worked very closely with our military in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, the Canadian effort was highly respected and their opinion was highly regarded. I, I don't see, see why that will, will change. I would, I, I'm not sure that's happened in the last eight years. I would hope it would happen yeah. uh, beginning this Friday. Uh, let's hope that's true, but I worry about it um, for two reasons. Uh, the first is um, Canada is going to have um, crises of its own sure. to face. Sure. Uh, this highly protectionist administration that, um, you know, that is talking about for, um, hardening uh, borders to trade. Canada has a lot at stake. Some of the tax reforms talked about, changes in the corporate tax and the repatriation mm -hmm. of capital may have the effect of discouraging investment in Canada. So Canada is going to have a very long agenda of its own. It's not going to be able to be the kind of friend of Latvia that Latvia would want. <laughs> but secondly, the way, the, the way that Canada has exerted influence on these issues in the past is by saying, hey, you know, we're a NATO stalwart. And as a NATO stalwart, you know, we claim a right to be heard on behalf of some maybe other people in NATO who maybe are laggards. But this administration at its center, never mind the departments, but at its center does not, not only does not care about NATO, but may actually be hostile to NATO. Yeah. And at that point when you say, look, we did this in Afghanistan, they may say, hmm, that, no, what, that's not what we that care about. That was them, yeah. And that's not what we care about. Yeah. Are you still as hopeful after listening to him for? Uh, probably more hopeful. I think, uh, <laughs> you know, I just, I think it's important we don't prejudge. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, they hadn't been sworn in yet, and he's already saying these things are going to happen. Let's, let's have a little open-mindedness and, and give the administration a chance. And I, you know, I, I this, uh, get tickled thinking about this interview because it sort of 
glass half empty, glass yes, half full. Yes, yes, that's why you're a good pairing. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but I'm just, uh, you know, I'm more, I'm more upbeat on America. I'm more positive about yeah. this administration. I think uh, I would just ask all of us not to prejudge, keep an open mind, and, and be respectful and give them a chance before you go ahead and say this is going to be the terrible things that are going to happen. We don't know that. Let's give the guy a chance. These aren't prejudgments. These are post-judgments. Donald Trump has already said that maybe he'll fulfill uh, America's Article 5 obligations to, uh, to countries under attack, and maybe he won't. That question, once uttered, can't be unuttered. Yes. Um, and if he'd lost, then yeah, it wouldn't matter. But the, 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 the fact that the, the candidate for president said, here's something I won't do, that the United States is pledged by the most solemn of treaties to do, and now he's on his way to being president, that doubt, once introduced, you can't undo that doubt. Um, and there are many, many other things that have already happened. Um, the Trump-Putin relationship is already there. We don't know why he is so um, committed to the relationship. Um, and we can speculate, but that's not maybe useful. But we can see what the commitment is mm. and how um, that there is a there's a closer relationship with Russia than there is with Germany, and that is a, a reversal of everything that has happened in the world since 1945. I think the folks he's surrounding himself with, with uh, the cabinet selections particularly, should all give us uh, a good feeling, a positive feeling. And one thing for sure, you can have us back on your show six months from now, <laughs> and one of us is going to be pretty wrong and one of us is going to be okay. pretty right. Okay, all right, I'm yeah. going to hold you to that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you Thank both you. very Thank much. You. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> we called that our glass half empty, glass half full panel because that's the way those guys work. Washington has been extremely busy, as you can imagine, preparing for the big day tomorrow. Lots of street closures and security will hit the streets of D.C. to get a close-up look at how events are going to unfold tomorrow. Stick around for that. I think it's going to be a great day for America, uh, dawn of a new era, and uh, I think there's going to be great things uh, ahead. What do, you, what do you want to hear from him tomorrow in that speech? Uh, you know, I think at this point, unity, I think, is, is strong.
Hey, welcome back. We're broadcasting live from the Canadian Embassy in Washington on the eve of the inauguration of Donald Trump. Just to give you an idea of where everything is happening tomorrow, events uh, start at Capitol Hill that is just behind me and where we are. Then the parade will make its way down Pennsylvania Avenue. Here at the embassy, we're right in the middle of the parade route. And to give you an idea of what's happening at street level as people prepare for tomorrow, well, I was wandering around there earlier today. Right down there is Pennsylvania Avenue, which is where the inaugural parade will take place and where the Canadian Embassy is situated. So we've got prime real estate for all that viewing tomorrow. We are on Capitol Hill, and that's the Capitol Hill buildings where the House and the Senate sit, and of course where the President-elect will give his inaugural address tomorrow. If you listen, they're already practicing. And there's hundreds of people here now, but there's also hundreds of people lined up at various buildings for their free tickets to the inaugural address. Some standing, some sitting. Just to situate you a little bit more, all the way down that way is the Washington Monument and the National Mall. There's lots of security barricades up to try and control the hundreds of thousands of people they expect here tomorrow. The parade starts here and heads down Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House. And there are some traditions, of course, with that parade. For instance, it was back in 1977 that then President Jimmy Carter decided he'd get out of the car and walk part of the way, something President Obama did as well. We'll see whether the new president tries that tomorrow. I won't get anywhere near that close tomorrow. Not, not even close. Uh, as we know, Canada is preparing in many different ways for this incoming administration. Last week, the Prime Minister shuffled his cabinet to try and get better communication with the new administration. Will these efforts be enough? And how would Canada deal with a tough talking Trump? Earlier, I spoke with the former U.S. ambassador to Canada, Gordon Giffen. Here's part of that conversation. Nice to see you, Mr. Giffen. Great to see you. Great Welcome to Washington. Yeah, it's good. Uh, you know, Trump has been very tough talking on trade, and it would seem now this this letter has been sent to Canada saying, uh, we're doing this, this is our top priority, NAFTA, and here are some of the areas of concern. How, how worried should Canadians be about that? Oh, I don't think people should be worried. I think it's an agenda that's been put on the table. Canada's, I'm sure, fully prepared to have a discussion on, on the various issues, and I'm sure Canada's got their view of of their own perspective on what needs to be discussed so I don't think it's gonna at the end of the day be hugely disruptive the country of origin rules though changing that that would be problematic for Canada if that was on the table well it depends it on how they're changed right um, I, I don't know at this point what what the Trump trade thinkers have in mind uh, but we've pretty much North Americanized most of our commerce so to try and identify things from Canada or things from the United States by that kind of label uh, would be moving backwards. What about just trying to uh, reduce the number of things that would be duty-free? We should be increasing the free flow of goods and people across our common border. Period. Period. So what, so what do we do with, with these conversations about not doing that? Then? Well, I think we have to have a, uh, a, an open and, and direct dialogue about what makes sense for both countries' interests and, and more harmonization on economic terms. I'm not talking about political terms um, uh, or sovereignty terms. Yeah. I'm just talking about economics. If you were going to give um, the Canadian government a piece of advice, or, or whoever else to approach the new Trump administration, one piece of advice, what would it be? I'd say don't react to every uh, little event in Washington over the course of the next month. Uh, take your time, be deliberate, be thoughtful. Okay, now that the music started, we'll stop. Yeah, time to dance. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Giffen. Appreciate Thank it very you. much. Thank <laughs> you. You can see more of that conversation with Gordon Giffen online at cbc.ca slash politics. Donald Trump says he's written his inaugural address himself. Over the course of history, what have other presidents said at that moment? We'll dig into the archives from the 1930s on up to have a listen. That's where it's all going to happen tomorrow. Don't go away. I will see you tomorrow, and I'm going to be cheering you on. You're going to cheer me on, but I'm going to be cheering you on because what we've done is so special. All over the world, they're talking about it. All over the world. And I love you folks, and we're gonna work together, and we are going to 
Make America great again, and I'll add, greater than ever before. Hey, welcome back to Power and Politics. We are live in Washington, D.C., but that is uh, what is happening in New York City right now because the other part of an inauguration, and perhaps particularly this one, is the protest movement around it. Michael Moore has been, uh, of course, leading some of that protest throughout the campaign and now, and he says that this begins the first 100 days not of action and the Trump administration, but of uh, resistance by this movement. We'll just listen to a little bit of this live. You don't have to quit your job. You don't have to drop out of school. It's just something very small you have to do. Every day, you have to contact your member of Congress or your sen one of your two senators. Every day. It takes three minutes. Wake up, brush teeth, make coffee, contact Congress. That's the new morning routine. The phone number is 202-225-3121. You call that number any time of the day or night, a human being answers it. There's an actual 24-7 switchboard. Call that number. If you don't know who your congressperson is, that's OK. Just give them your zip code. Everybody knows their zip code. Give them your zip code and they'll go, oh, well, your member of Congress is Jerome Nadler. May I put that's you That's Michael through? Moore, uh, director and uh, activist. I think that's fair to say. 
calling on people to take action against the Trump administration starting tomorrow. We will see some of that unfold, the inaugural events as they unfold tomorrow. Uh, in and around this place, but also on Saturday when we're expecting a women's march to protest the new administration as well. But before all that happens, Donald Trump has to take the oath of office to become the 45th president of the United States. He will then give his inaugural address just behind me here, which he has said he has written himself. But here's a look back at how that event has played out in history ever since the 32nd president took office. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The biggest inaugural in United States history is ready to begin. We believe that all men are created equal. I, Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. So help you God. So help me God. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. For the first time, a president's wife holds the Bible, a gift from his mother, as Mr. Johnson is sworn in. For the first time, for the 37th president of the United States, Richard Milhouse Nixon, hail to the chief. The American dream does not come to those who fall asleep. But I assume the presidency under extraordinary circumstances never before experienced by Americans. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Now, I congratulate you, sir. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. George Walker Bush do solemnly swear. Today I say to you that the challenges we face are real. They are serious and they are many. They will not be met easily or in a short span of time. But know this, America, they will be met. Donald Trump will join that list of American presidents tomorrow on Inauguration Day. Here's what the schedule looks like so you can line it all up for yourself too. The president-elect will meet with the Obamas at the White House at 9.30 in the morning. Donald Trump and Barack Obama will then ride together to Capitol Hill. The swearing-in ceremony starts at 11.30 Eastern. Donald Trump will take the oath of office around noon. From that moment on, he is the president of the United States and he and Vice President Pence, who will also take an oath, will review the troops, then lead the inaugural parade from the Capitol down Pennsylvania Avenue. In the evening at 7 p.m. Eastern, Trump is expected to attend all three inaugural balls. You'll want to stay tuned throughout the day here on CBC News Network. We'll bring you all the pomp and the protests. And just so you know where the other president is headed, instead of continuing on, he's going to uh, attend part of it, hop into a uh, helicopter, and take off on a well-earned vacation. Earlier this hour, Donald Trump spoke at an inauguration concert at the Lincoln Memorial. The CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick is up next with more on that. Stay there.
Hey, welcome back to Power and Politics. We are live at the Canadian Embassy in Washington in a fabulous setting as we get ready for the Trump administration. And as Canada and the U.S. relationship enters this new phase, who will be in charge of some of the key portfolios in Washington and who's their Canadian counterpart? Here's a look at Team Trudeau and Team Trump. But we need an open and frank dialogue with Russia. Rex Tillerson, former head of ExxonMobil, is Trump's pick for Secretary of State. If confirmed, he'll be dealing with Canada's new Foreign Affairs Minister, Christia Freeland, who also has primary responsibility for the Canada-U.S. trade file. Both will be faced with Vladimir Putin and Russia. Tillerson has close ties with the Kremlin, while Freeland is a critic of Russia who's been banned from entering that country. NAFTA, one of the worst deals ever. And if Trump follows through on his pledge to tear up NAFTA, Freeland would have to deal with that renegotiation. NAFTA is not the only trade issue. The ongoing dispute about softwood lumber, the future of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Those talks fall to U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer, a former negotiator in the Reagan administration and Canada's new international trade minister, François-Philippe Champagne. A challenge, especially when it comes to one of the biggest nations in the world, China. Lighthizer has long fought for higher import tariffs against China, while the Trudeau government is beginning talks to drum up a trade deal. Another likely hurdle, the environment. Environmental statutes. Trump's pick to head the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Scott Pruitt. The Oklahoma Attorney General is a climate change skeptic and ally of the fossil fuel industry. Environment Minister Catherine McKenna has championed the Paris climate deal and is forging ahead with a carbon tax for the provinces. Former Texas Governor Rick Perry is Trump's pick for U.S. Energy Secretary. He and Canada's Natural Resources Minister Jim Carr actually do have something in common. They're looking to increase oil and gas pipeline capacity in North America and champion renewable energy. Retired Marine General John Kelly, Trump's nominee for Department of Homeland Security. He will deal with Liberal veteran Ralph Goodale, Canada's Minister of Public Security. Their job largely depends on how Trump will proceed with promises such as building a wall on the Mexican border, expelling millions of undocumented migrants and cracking down on global terrorism. Of course, a big sign of how seriously this new administration takes Canada won't be known until Trump names the new ambassador to this country. The Make America Great Again welcome celebration has ended in Washington. Donald Trump was there with his family, even sang along to some of the songs. Let's go now to the CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick, who's just outside that concert. Okay, Megan, what did Trump have to say tonight? Well, he was full of thanks, Rosemary, uh, thanking his family and all of the supporters who helped get him to where he is tonight on the eve of his inauguration. He was remarking on the size of the crowd that was packed in here in front of the Lincoln Memorial, and it was big. There were a lot of people down here, a lot of enthusiastic people, and he was promising to work hard for Americans, making America great again, of course, uh, using his slogan, which got the crowd cheering. But he also said that he wants to make America great for everyone. He was sounding a note of unification. Let's take a listen to a little bit more of what Trump told the crowd here. We're going to make America great for all of our people. Everybody, everybody throughout our country. That includes the inner cities. That includes everybody. Okay, Megan, uh, any reaction to what he had to say tonight? Yeah, I was able to talk to a few people as they were streaming out of here, and they were pumped up. <laughs> there were a lot of excited people coming out of here, and they were feeling very patriotic, they told me. That was partly because of the musical acts here as well. Toby Keith is known for very patriotic lyrics. Uh, but they were excited. They said the energy in there was great, and they were saying if you didn't feel like a proud American, you don't know, she didn't know what was wrong with people. So a lot of people said that uh, Trump was the main attraction. They were excited to see him, and now they're even more excited for 
for what's about to happen tomorrow. Okay. Thanks, Megan. We'll, of course, see you lots tomorrow throughout the day. That's the CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick outside the Lincoln Memorial. That's Power and Politics for uh, today. I'm Rosemary Barton at the Canadian Embassy. Join us again tomorrow for the inauguration of Donald Trump. The CBC News special begins at 6 a.m. Eastern with Heather Hiscox, but the special itself starts with our chief correspondent at 10 Eastern with lots of coverage from our correspondents across uh, this country and around the world. A special edition of Power and Politics will start, of course, at 5 Eastern. We'll be back here at the Embassy to give you all the day's events and reaction to them, including uh, with some of our own cabinet ministers who are down here for the inauguration. On the Money's coming up next on CBC News Network. Make sure you catch Peter Mansbridge from this location tonight on The National. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow.